Today, I have Peter Gregg with me. He's a professional photographer and YouTube personality, and he's here to answer your questions and mine about migrating to mirrorless cameras. So if you're thinking of moving to mirrorless, you're not going to want to miss this. Delivering informative capability-based reviews and tutorials on camera gear, filming techniques, and content creation. Hi, it's Simon, and this is The Ordinary Filmmaker. If you're new here, please click like and subscribe as it really helps grow my channel. And all the links to everything I talk about in this video, I put them in the description down below. Peter, thanks so much for visiting The Ordinary Filmmaker once again. Hi, Simon. How are you doing? I hear you loud and clear all the way down here in Miami. I understand you're a few miles north of me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Peter, I'm all the way up uh, right on the outskirts of uh, Toronto. So, yeah, it's a few miles away. Got it. Got it. So, thank you for having me on your show today. I understand we're going to kind of do like a, uh, a chit chat back and forth, uh, a little bit of an interview style, but a little bit of where we actually converse because many people might not know this, but we are actually friends and not just YouTube acquaintances. No, that's very right, Peter. Um, or that's very correct, Peter. My, my language speak me not properly right now. But yeah, we've gotten to know each other quite well over the past six months or so now. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Peter has been an instrument helping me grow my channel because he's, well, I'm gonna, we're gonna get into this very shortly. Uh, but Peter has a lot of experience, and I think one thing that's very important when you are starting out is don't be afraid to listen and take advice. Uh, I'm on the edge of 4,000 subscribers, and I've only been doing this five months. But Peter, the reason for this interview or discussion is that one of my viewers suggested we do a video looking at pioneers in mirrorless technology. His choice of words, pioneer, not mine, but he wants to know from pros that have already migrated to mirrorless and that have made it work. And I understand that you've been a photographer for many decades now and only have recently moved into video. Not many people, viewers, <laughs> sorry, not many viewers know about your work outside of YouTube. So how long have you been in photography? I would say I was in photography uh, right at the beginning of my teenage years. Do you want to hear the story or we'll, we'll bypass that? No, no, tell, I'm, I'm curious to know because I've got my own stories of how I got started and I think part of the type of stories I want to tell, I want them to be human interest stories. I don't want it to be just bits and bites and techniques and tutorials. I want there to be some life in my, my uh, uh, videos. It's an easy story. You know, your parents tell you don't do this and don't do that. And as you approach, uh, you know, you're 10, 11, 12 years old, uh, you start disobeying. So uh, my mother is a full-time professional photographer and my dad is a full-time professional florist. Uh, and so the two would feed each other in terms of business. So uh, I got into her cameras. It's as simple as that. Don't touch the cameras. Peter dove in and touched the cameras. So uh, rather than getting punished, uh, what they did is they put me to work. And little by little, I learned more and more until I finally became, I would say maybe at 15 years old, I became my mother's cameraman. So she would set up the shots at a wedding, you know, fix the bride's dress, make that long train, uh, you know, look pretty and everything. And I'd be standing there focusing and doing my job. And then she would turn, you know, to me and said, get ready to shoot, Peter. Okay. And then she would engage the bride and the groom in a conversation uh, to pose them. And then she would say, shoot. <laughs> I had to push my finger and shoot that shot. So um, I had many years of doing that before I launched out on my own and started doing weddings by myself. So that got me into cameras and photography, which is two different things. So that kind of reaches on to my next discussion point is what kind of work did you do? Have you always focused on wedding photography? It started on wedding photography and because that was uh, what was fed to me right off the bat. Uh, but you know, uh, as a guy, you want to expand. It's like, well, I don't want to just do what my parents did. So I expanded and got into different types of photography. The very first type was product photography uh, because uh, I was taking pictures of of uh, you know designs that my dad would do in his business and uh, he would use them in uh, different types of advertising so people saw that and they went well can you do that with my products too so I got into product photography it didn't grow very big 
uh, it was mostly weddings, and weddings naturally will lead you to portraits. Uh, but the interesting thing was getting into actually live events. Like, can you, can you do our wedding anniversary? Can you do the uh, pictures? There was no video back then, okay? So it was all pictures. And then can you do my son's birthday uh, uh, party and stuff like that? The first child in any family gets the most money spent on him. The next one that comes along is kind of like a big step down in terms of money that actually gets spent. So baby photography got added to my repertoire pretty quickly. And then from there, we got into uh, something that I found more interesting because I got involved as a youth pastor in the church and stuff. So high school, I don't know if you've got it up there, but high school senior photography is a big deal down here in Miami uh, and actually in the United States. So I started doing high school senior photography. That grew to be almost as big as the weddings because uh, I get along with kids really, really well. So that's kind of like the history of film. And then at some point, guess what? That got jumped over into digital. Now, Peter, you, you, you mentioned a point there about high school. And when I was young, which was, you know, many, many years ago, um, yes, we had photography in the school and it was, this was long before digital as well, but it never interested me back then. I mean, I had a point and shoot and it was pretty bad in terms of quality, but I looked at these cameras and it seemed to be I needed a degree in math, so I never got into it. But how long have you been in photography for and did you travel a lot? I've been in photography, I would say, since the 70s. I graduated high school in the 70s. So I know as I was the yearbook photographer, or one of the yearbook photographers, at the high school that I went to. Uh, and there, I came into that already having a knowledge of photography, which they recognized. And of course, when people, like in a school or any kind of an organization or a church, recognize you have a talent, they go, ah, how can I put that to work for me? <laughs> So they put me in to be the yearbook photographer. So I would say I started from what? Uh, 17, 18, when, you know, at 18, 19, I was already doing my own weddings. Wow. And now I understand about 10 years ago, you started to make a switch into video. Yes, I did. Actually, it was around the year 2001, which makes it more, a little more than 10 years now. <laughs> wow. So why not stay with photography? What caught your interest with video? Uh, things changed in my life. Uh, I'm out there doing pictures, doing weddings and stuff like that. Uh, my mother had a stroke and needed help. So I moved out of my condominium back into the house where I actually grew up and started taking care of her. Uh, and that evolved into her uh, getting cancer and passing away. Uh, and the day after that, dad had a heart attack. And I went from doing hospice for one parent to doing hospice for the other. Uh, it was important to them that they didn't die in a hospital, but actually wanted to be in their home. So I facilitated that and I became full time. So that ended the photography career. And I was about the age where I was considering retiring. So um, I actually uh, launched, well, what can I do? I can't go out, I can't leave. So I got a camera and I got YouTube and lo and behold, it was a marriage, me and YouTube. And there was one other part. I actually got a check from Google, <laughs> YouTube. And that money caught my attention. It's like, whoa, we got money here. What is this all about? So I, I started looking. It was like, oh, because of the YouTube videos you put up, we're giving you money. So I said, I like that. And that career was born. Terrific. Well, before we get on to really jumping into today's topic, I really like to understand what type of equipment people use, what type of lenses they use. So just before you got into video, can you tell us a little bit about the type of equipment you were using? Lenses, bodies, and et cetera. Are you talking about film or digital? Well, you know, <laughs> what were you using? Was it, were you on film or digital? I guess 2001 digital wasn't quite ready, was it? Uh, that's when it finally came into being. Uh, so up until then, I was using medium format uh, film uh, with a, uh, I, I basically settled into a camera called the twin lens reflex. So you've got your big expensive cameras like the Hasselblads, the Roloflexes, uh, the Pentaxes and those, and they uh, shoot films. They're expensive, they're bulky. 
So uh, the twin lens reflex is a much lighter camera, which is very nice for me. Uh, the negative on that is you can't change the lenses. So I was shooting medium format film. Uh, I, I wanted to differentiate myself, Simon, from the other guys where they were shooting uh, 35 millimeter film for weddings and stuff. So always wanting to step it up a notch, I was shooting medium format. And then uh, Nikon and Kodak were dabbling in uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the digital cameras. And then from that point, I got interested and I got my hands onto a Nikon, but it wasn't quite there. You could, it wasn't the same thing as film. But when Nikon um, uh, kind of like just kept the same mark going, Canon jumped in and came in with a camera called the D30. And that's where my digital picture taking uh, started from the Canon D30. And I've climbed the ladder all the way up of Canon's uh, products uh, in digital, and uh, that's how the transition was happening. It was, you know, at that point, it was like we see maybe today's, uh, uh, you know, if you want a video camera, stop buying a DS DSLR, you know, buy a, a video camera. Well, back then, the fight, well, there's always a fight. It was real photographers shoot film. Only these fake guys, you know, will actually shoot digital. So. That's where it was like, well, I still shoot film. I'm doing proper photography. And I'm going, well, what can I tell you? I've moved on into digital. So that was the beginning of the fights of the photographers, which have lasted through uh, film versus digital, raw versus JPEG. And now it's, uh, uh, you know, I need focus. I don't need focus. I need, uh, you know, this, I need that. So it's an ongoing thing. It never ends. Well, and that's a good point. And, and as you were speaking, I was thinking this is a great segue into the next uh, part of the discussion. Throughout the last 50 years, there have been major changes to photography. There was uh, the whole idea of we don't need autofocus. Professionals don't, don't need autofocus. I can do a great job without it. And the truth was, at the time, a lot of shots weren't really in focus. And then people adopted autofocus and it went really well. And even I remember the discussion myself, Peter, about digital is not ready, professionals aren't going to use it, it's, it's a passing fad. And here we are today, uh, I don't even know where I can go to buy film, let alone is digital good enough? It obviously is. So as a professional yourself, uh, what do you think is stopping some professional photographers from going to mirrorless? I didn't realize going to mirrorless was an issue. I thought that you're in digital and you're going to pick uh, the camera that you're going to want to choose. So why don't you dive down into what you're trying to tell me on that question? Well, and uh, so what, what I'm trying to do is I'm also trying to convey questions that have been given to me from some of my viewers. Um, I, I myself, Peter, as you know, I'm, I'm capability based. So I look at what capabilities this camera will give me. So right now I'm contemplating getting an R5 or an R6, not because it's mirrorless, not because I don't like DSLRs, but because I look at the video and the photo capabilities of this camera, it looked to be almost 100% of what I'm looking for on my next camera. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect camera, but I do believe if you, you understand what capabilities you're looking for, you can find a camera that's best for you. So I, I know that people have certain ideas of what mirrorless is and what DSLRs are in terms of what problems are. So let me ask you a few questions and let's see if we can We'll, we'll try and get there. So I understand that DSLRs have high speed flash sync. Um, why is that important? All right, so what we want to trans transition to is actually your first question was actually uh, pretty much on target. Uh, there are some people that think, well, I'm going to switch from a DSLR to a mirrorless like it's a big deal. But you kind of answered the question because you said you're, you're buying your camera based on the functionality, what it does, and, and if it has the items that you want listed, which actually nails it right there. So uh, you ha actually have a DSLR, which has a mirror. That's why it's called the digital lens. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a single lens reflex. And re reflex uh, does not mean a mirror that goes up and down, by the way. It just means it has a reflective surface in there because you have twin lens reflex which has two lenses one that takes the shot and the other one 
that you actually focus through. So it is a TSLR, which is a twin lens reflex. So reflex does not mean a mirror that goes up and down. It just means it's got a mirror, okay? So uh, what, the, uh, what the digital cameras did is they did away, I'm sorry, what the mirrorless cameras did is they did away with the mirror. So now you're looking at these cameras and you're going, okay, this looks pretty good. What's, what's in it for me or where is it gonna cost me? So a good place to start is why would a person maybe go from a DSLR to a mirrorless camera, uh, maybe on a professional level? Would that be a fair question to, for me to continue yeah, that, on to? That's, that's my next question, yes, that's very fair. Okay, so um, the digital, uh, uh, the DSLRs, all right, have two uh, parts to them. They've got the sensor that records the actual uh, uh, picture, okay? But where is the focusing done if the mirror is down? So the focusing is actually done in another spot, a sensor separate from the main sensor. And there's an algorithm built into these cameras, and that algorithm tells the, the, uh, the camera how to focus and how well it does and stuff like that. So by having two different places where the, it's actually re recorded, the image is recorded in one spot and focused in another spot, <clears throat> excuse me, opens up the possibility of calibration issues, okay? So in the first maybe five to six years of uh, uh, digital cameras, you'd go to shoot a wedding and you'd come back with a lot of out of focus pictures. So why was that? Uh, that was because it's being focused in another place and you're not able to see that happening because you are not looking at an EVF in a uh, digital uh, DSLR ca type camera. So enter the mirrorless cameras. Now the focusing is done, boom, in the same exact place where the image is getting recorded. So now this is a whole new concept and people are going like, uh, you know, this Canon camera or this Sony camera is so much sharper than my other camera you know, and they think that there's some magic going on. There isn't magic there. The fact is it's getting focused in the same spot where the picture's getting taken inside your camera. So the mirrorless actually eliminates a huge problem of calibration between the focusing sensor and the uh, recording sensor. Now I understand too that if, there, there's pretty much a theoretical, well not a theoretical, there is a limit at which um, at how fast DSLRs can go. So the 1DX Mark III right now, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think it's the currently the fastest DSLR at 16 frames per second mechanical. And that's because you've got a mirror and you've got to move that out of the way. So at a certain point, that thing can't move much faster than about 16 frames per second, whereas mirrorless cameras today can do at least 30 frames per second. Uh, and another thing about the 1DX Mark III is I believe it has a data uh, throughput rate of about 995 million um, pixels per second. And if we were to take, if I was to design a, an R1, for example, I would say, okay, if we can transfer that same data rate over, and I wanted to keep 20 megapixels or 20.2 megapixels, I could produce about 49 frames a second. Whereas there's no way a DSLR could even get close to that speed. What do you think about that? Or am I completely off base? No, you're not off base. You're getting into calculations and analytics, which you've always been way ahead of me on that. <laughs> uh, but a person that's gonna buy a camera is just gonna look at the frames per second and they're gonna see if it's uh, okay for them or not. Now, just going back 10 years, we've, we've not doubled but we're, we got the low level cameras that are doing 10 and, 12 second, uh, 10 and 12 frames per second. Well, that was unheard of in 2007, 2006. It's like four frames per second, unless you actually did, like you said, buy the 1D, whatever was popular at that time. Uh, I think I was running the 1D uh, Mark II N, and then I switched over to the 1D Mark III. So the 1D Mark III, by the way, just for a little bit of history, is where Canon stumbled and, and fumbled and Nikon came and, pick, and picked up the ball. That was right about uh, 2008. So that, that's just, you know, a little, uh, whatever they call it, trivia there. Uh, so by looking at the frames per second that I see today, I'm going like, holy cow, they used to do, you know, uh, touchdowns and football passes and all kinds of stuff at eight frames per second and getting the shots. So the skill is in the photographer. 
So uh, homing in on that is not really a good place to home in on. Uh, going back to our conversation, I wanted to bring up uh, a little bit of a difference between mirrorless and DSLR and the flash, which you brought up and I conveniently ignored. <laughs> so now <laughs> I'm going to bring you back to that. Go ahead, ask me a question about the flash, Simon. <laughs> well, yes, so I understand what, that there is a difference between how mirrorless and DSLRs handle the flash. Can you tell me a bit more about that, Peter? Yes, it comes in a number of flavors. Number one, is what they call the sync speed. Uh, the sync speed is how high your, your shutter speed can go and stay in synchronization with the, uh, with the flash unit, okay? So this is uh, not a flash issue, it's actually a sensor issue. So the CMOS, which is basically what everything is based on today, has got its own limitation of about a, a two hundredth of a second, to 250, uh, maybe some lower end cameras years ago would be able to sync only to 160th. So lo and behold, they invented something called high speed sync. So high speed sync allowed the flash to flash really quickly, but at a lower level because it doesn't have the juice to fire at high levels. So you got that. So um, the only way to get unmarried from a, a 200 uh, or 250th of a second um, uh, uh, shutter speed is to change the shutter, okay? So what we have today is called focal plane shutters or the CMOS have their own shutters built in, how fast they can turn, you know, the, the uh, sensor on and off. So you've got a different type of shutter that's called a LEAF, L-E-A-F shutter. That shutter is usually in the lens and not in the camera body. That type of a shutter, which is available on some of the medium format digital cameras, okay, uh, you can uh, synchronize at any speed. There's no limitations. So to make that into a simple sentence, uh, a leaf shutter allows you to synchronize your flash at any speed that you want. You want to shoot at 1 60th of a second, go. If you want to shoot at 1 1,000th of a second, go, okay? But that's only on a leaf type shutter. Sensors that create the shutters or mechanical uh, shutters like you mentioned, okay, they have a limitation because of the sensor and that is 200 to 250th of a second uh, of a sync speed. And then you've got to downgrade your, your flash power to high speed sync. Uh, that, that issue has pretty much gone away. Uh, every once in a while you'll hear, why can't they make one that can sync at a higher rate? Well, I just answered that question because we're not using a leaf shutter. A leaf shutter is kind of looks like the f-stop. You know how the blades open and close? It's yep. like that. That is also a shutter and it opens and closes. So that's what a leaf shutter. So if you want to, if you want to kill, you know, the problem with the synchronization speed, get a camera where you've got lenses that you can put leaf shutters in. Hasselblad, Pentax, uh, Phase One, uh, I, I think Fuji has that too. I'm not sure. I'd have to check out if they got leaf shutters. So that's how you defeat that problem. Um, I do want to get into another problem, uh, and that is what what is one of the major things that a photographer will give up if they go from DSLR to mirrorless in terms of flash? Do you have any clue where, where that's going to be heading? Well, now, this is what I was kind of driving to. I figured you would, you would touch on it and you'd, you'd take it. Um, the, I understand that with a DSLR, there's a sensor and it's invisible. I guess it's using infrared light and it's able to determine the distance. Uh, am I on the right track? Yeah, you're just placing everything kind of in the wrong category. Can, can I answer that question? I wish you would because like I've said to many of my viewers, I've been doing video for so long, I, I'm a little bit rusty when it comes to photography. Okay, um, I'm going to put the phone down for a second because I want to pick up this flash unit and show, uh, which means uh, they won't hear you if you say anything, but I'll, I'll let you know when I've ended. So I'm holding up a flash unit. This is something you buy that's extra that goes onto your camera. So if you have a camera, a lot of the lower end cameras have a pop-up flash. But when you get into upper level stuff, you want to get, you want to graduate out of the pop-up flash and put something like this, okay, onto your hot shoe. 
Now this is a different brand, it doesn't go with this, but this is for illustration purposes. So this flash actually gives you a high powered source of light, which is what you want. Now if you take a good look at this, let me switch my cameras over to um, my hand cam. I'm gonna put this in here so you can see it. And let me get it so there's no shadow. And let me actually push the button in focus. Okay, so you see this red area right here? That red area actually is a little flash gun inside. Okay, and this is your main flash that comes out here and blasts the heck out of your subjects. So this will flash a pattern at an infrared frequency. And that infrared frequency is designed by the camera to actually be, it, the camera's actually looking for that pattern. And it's looking for that frequency of light. So that actually allows a photographer, if he so chooses, which I can't imagine why they would do that, you can actually shoot in pitch black because the camera is providing a pattern and that pattern can be projected, I would say, 18 to 20 feet max, okay? But it happens so fast you don't see it and it's not distracting, okay? So when you get into a little bit of a lower light area, so let's, uh, let's use an event, okay? Because so, we're talking about photographers, professionals, uh, switching over to mirrorless. You lose that functionality and the reason that you lose it is the sensor itself has a filter built into it to get rid of that light frequency because it actually throws the sensor off. So what you actually paid for in your uh, external flash is now gone. You have a feature that is now gone. So you, uh, some people will say, yeah, but they, they focus so well now in low light. Now think of yourself as under the gun and you've got to get that picture Okay, so now you're gambling if, if, the camera, if the camera's actually going to be able to nail that shot or not. So with the external flash unit, with that infrared light, that it's not infrared, just to keep it clear, okay? It's in that infrared frequency level. It's actually a light source, and it flashes like your flash does. It doesn't just project it like a flashlight and stay on. So when you switch from DSLR to... Uh, mirrorless, suddenly your events uh, are in question because now it's harder to focus or you use what's built into the camera which is kind of like taking a flashlight and projecting it into the eyes of people which ticks people off. It's like don't aim that thing at me because they, they make like an atmosphere. They lower the lights and then after they lower the lights, the DJ starts flashing, <laughs> okay? So you've got all this crap going on and you're trying to tell the camera to figure it out, okay? Well, it was all there and the answer was all there to begin with. So if you move over to mirrorless, you lose that. Now, if it's worth it for you, Simon, or anybody to lose that, <clears throat> excuse me, or run a two camera uh, system where when you go to the reception, you switch over to a DSLR, uh, uh, because DSLRs use that function. That will light up if you have a DSLR. That red section will light up. So the 90D, the 1DX Mark III <clears throat> will use that function, okay? The uh, R5, I assume, unless they change something, will not. The R will definitely not. Uh, any of the cameras I have in here will not fire the red light. They don't want to add infrared light because they're already trying to filter it out. So they're going like, Wait a week, what are we doing here? So we're not gonna fire it, okay? So if you go to mirrorless, you actually lose that ability uh, and you have to determine how important that is, okay? For me, uh, it's not worth throwing that away. I wanna nail the shot first time, every time. Time is money. It, time is money, okay? But there's also a confidence. It's like, is that picture gonna be in focus? So now you start to do what they call chimping. You take a picture and you check and see if it's in focus. Okay, so you're the professional, all right? So, uh, you know, as soon as a bunch of girls get around and they're gonna take all these uh, phone pictures and stuff, they, eat, they all take the picture, okay? And most of them will stop taking pictures and immediately look at the picture. And then, and then that's when they start like, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. A professional photographer can't afford to drop his camera when he could be shooting those girls all looking at the picture and going ooh ah on their iPhones, you know? So it's, it's cute, okay, but it's real. So that's one example of where if a DSLR has an advantage over a mirrorless, are there any other real examples of issues with one over the other? 
Uh, well, to simplify uh, the issue that I just mentioned, you lose the, uh, the flash's ability to uh, do focus assist, is what it's called. Uh, the body has it, but it's like a flashlight. So on, uh, on a mirrorless, you lose that. Okay, but you do gain something else. You gain a much larger percentage on a mirrorless of in-focus pictures because now you're not using a separate sensor like uh, the 90D. You actually have a 70D, if I recall, correct? So That's correct. Uh, when you're not in live view mode, okay, I'm, I'm talking Canon talk for a second. When you're not in live view mode, the, Canon, the, the camera can't focus. So it's actually using a different sensor to focus with. But when you switch your 70D to the live view mode, suddenly you are now focusing with something very nice. It's called dual pixel autofocus. Okay. Uh, but if the mirror is going to be used, you lose that. So that is basically the crux of the problems. Uh, maybe size? What do you think of size on, on, on mirrorless? Does it matter to you? Um, yeah, it, it does. And I'd say size is more or less about the right size. So there's a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, ergonomics. I have big hands, so I find that as much as I love the X-T3, and I haven't tried the X-T4, but it's a little bit too small on my hands. And then, of course, you've got the battery life situation. I've tried the EOS R, and I've tried the A7 III, and both of those actually feel much better in my hand. They feel more solid, so I need a certain size. I don't want to go too small. And of course, I also don't want to be popping in new batteries every 30 shots or 45 minutes of video record time. All right. While you were uh, uh, talking, I put a larger lens on this Olympus camera. Uh, this is a mirrorless camera. It's an old one, like a 20, 2011, 2012, whenever they came out with the EM1. Actually, right now, you're watching on Olympus EM1 Mark II, which would be the successor to this camera. So I do notice that on a Sony camera, Okay, they, they uh, trimmed the distance that goes between the, the back end of the lens and, the, and the, uh, the sensor. Okay, but what they did on the Sony is they added a little extra onto the lens. And that makes the camera front heavy like that. So if you're all night taking pictures, this is well balanced. Okay, so uh, uh, the, uh, the Olympus hasn't added that extra distance. But if I was going to take the lens, which I can't because we're using the Sony right now, uh, but you could look at pictures or you can even show them a picture if you want to, uh, how a Sony 50 millimeter uh, lens is what I'm using here. The 50 millimeter 1.4 lens. Look at the length of that lens and then imagine holding that. It's always kind of like, pull, it's like doing this. It's like pulling down on you, you know, and, uh, you know, it makes you wonder you know, if the lens mount is good and solid because there's always that draw to go like that, okay? So in the gym, you don't do that a lot. You do this, okay? And then you do this, but very rarely do you do that. Well, the camera makes you do that, <laughs> that motion I'm, I'm displaying, okay? And your hand gets tired. So a mirrorless, mostly, uh, even with the R that I had in here, uh, the camera is front heavy. All right, so uh, the Micro Four Thirds ha makes it very balanced. Um, and I think uh, you were mentioning to me, you were, you were comparing some lenses. So that becomes an important feature is that balance that you have. Because it, the, let's say you put a, a 200 millimeter lens, then you definitely are front heavy. But with a, a 50 millimeter lens, it shouldn't be like that, in my opinion. Well, yes, you brought up a good point. So I was doing a a video, I think I published it just on the weekend, I was looking at the difference between mirrorless and DSLRs, and I just focused on Canon, because each company has so many different cameras, I was going to be all over the place, and I think I took at least 30 to 40 minutes just doing Canon. And one of the things I realized is, not only did they make the R or the RF bodies a little bit lighter, but they also tackle the lenses, so the 70 to 200 is about a pound lighter. It's, it's actually shed 33% of its weight. And because it's got a telescoping lens, when it's not in use, you just simply um, take up one single slot in your carrying case. But the tried and true 24 to 105, uh, the, they have an EF version of it, but they came out with an RF version. It sheds another 95 grams and 11 millimeters. And not 
forgetting the optics alone, they're, they're, it, you've got that balance. So when you hold it in your hand, it doesn't feel awkward. And for me, as a primary video shooter, balance and weight are very important. Too light and I need a gimbal or a tripod or something else to add weight to it so that way my video doesn't appear jerky. Um, and I, I know, Peter, we can talk a bit more about this because you have multiple cameras. I just have the Canon right now. And the best form of in-body image stabilization with a Canon is you take a tripod, you bolt it to the underneath, and you walk around with that tripod. It gives you that extra weight that helps sort of uh, stabilize your video. Absolutely. You're 100% right. There's a few uh, things that photographers know to do. For instance, if you were holding a camera like this, I'm making a display here. I know you're not seeing me. Uh, on Otherwise, we would have uh, a problem going on in lip syncing. Uh, if I was to hold a camera like this, okay, th just a little bit of movement by my elbows causes a problem, okay? Camera shake. So professional photographers know you tuck it in, okay? The elbows come right up to the body and you shoot like that. It looks a little bit odd, okay? But that reduces camera shake. So just to make the interview a little bit interesting here, uh, I'm gonna say, uh, you know, there's people, there's a saying in the United States, like, I'm from Missouri, you got to show me, okay? So the experience that I've had with taking the Sony out with just a 50 millimeter lens la left a bad taste in my mouth, okay? So I, I think I would have to have it proven to me that, you know, the Canon, uh, maybe the R5 uh, would be a little bit more balanced because uh, I found with just the plain R, it wasn't that balanced for me, all right? Uh, and the 90D was very balanced for me. So I'm not saying I don't believe you because I know better than not to believe you, but to make it interesting, I don't believe you. <laughs> awesome, no, I, that, that's terrific. Um, look, I can't wait to have an R5 in my hands and I can't wait to have that discussion. And you know what, Peter? Now, I, this, here's an old saying I heard many years ago. I'm not always right, but I'm never wrong. Now, <laughs> as funny as that is, that's not how I really look at life. Um, I'm always making mistakes. Look at my videos. Look at my channel. And I have another saying, and if you're not making mistakes, if you're not doing things wrong, you're not trying hard enough. And that's one of the reasons why I have you, you here. I know you are a lot more experienced with photography and even videography. Uh, you've been doing YouTube for, I, I can't even count, but I know it's over 10 years now. I think going back to 01, which would make it 19 years. I think I actually started in, in video, I started in digital. I don't think video was a big thing um, until a little bit later. Plus, you know, a lot of photographers and videographers don't get along because the old style of videoing is uh, actually where uh, the bride's face is like right here, okay, and the videographer is just like kind of walking backwards and, and, and following, you know, and they actually made, uh, you know, tripods on wheels so that the videographer guy, uh, you know, could actually be within a hand's distance uh, of the bride. So while I'm trying to take pictures, there's this videographer there. So I didn't like the guy, okay? So videography did not, and then on top of it, he had this big bright light that he was shining in the bride's face, you know? So you had a choice. Either you're going to uh, meter and, and expose correctly for his big bright light, you know? And I'm talking like walking up the aisle, okay? There's this guy on a rolling cart with a camera uh, rolling up the aisle and that went on like that for years okay until videographers finally figure out oh there's something called available light where did that come from well hello i've been doing available light since the 80s you know so uh you know it's the it's the video part that i really didn't like and i don't want to get into but like i said when uh, YouTube finally sent me a check, I, I went like, whoa, money, what is this? They sent me money. I, let me find out why they sent me money. And it's because I had some videos up there that apparently were gaining traction. Now for me, it's become a business. I pay attention. I try to, you know, do the right thing and stuff like that. So I, actually the money was kind of like a draw. Here, Peter, we're dangling a dollar bill in front of your face. <laughs> so that's how I got more involved in video. And since uh, my wedding business and all of that had died, 
Uh, I did go out with a friend a couple of times, and I hate to tell you this, I want to say it really low, brides today are a pain in the butt. It's not the same. It's like, oh my God, I want everything and then some, and I want it for free, okay? And on top of that, I don't care about you. Well, you don't get the full meal because I'm not paying for a full meal for you at my wedding reception. So you, you just don't eat. So guess what? We had to add that into the contract that we get a meal, okay? And for me and if I have an assistant. Well, <laughs> they countered with that is they have a vendor's meal now, okay? It's not now, all right? So you get a, you know, a, an American cheese, grilled cheese sandwich while everybody's having filet mignon and the cracked crab and all that kind of stuff, you know? So uh, you, you never got treated up to par, but yet when they came to see the proofs, okay, and see their, their, their results, it was like, you know, this was the most important thing at my wedding, all right? However, that treatment didn't come across. Now, this is not for every bride. There are some brides that go the other side of things. They'll, they, they, they pamper you and stuff like that, and that I like a lot, okay? Uh, but no, we insist you come and eat with us and stuff like that, you know? And eventually, I did allow myself to, to sit down and eat, but I ate very quickly. So uh, it, it's changed tremendously. And it was the draw of that first check I got from YouTube that said, ooh, maybe there's something going on here. <laughs> I better look into this. Well, Peter, I, I'd look, I'd love to go back and talk about my early days of video. I got started at around 1993 and it was on a desktop computer. This was one of the, this was, I would say, the first desktop computer that allowed us to do video editing. Now, this is before we got into nonlinear editors, meaning basically we used hard drives and memory for our editing, but we would basically have Sony beta recorders, uh, three quarter inch, half inch tape, and we would, the computer would control all that. But I want to get us back, uh, if we have time at the end, we can get into that, but I want to get us back on track about mirrorless. And one of the things I want to ask you about is, why do you think photographers are more hesitant about moving to uh, mirrorless? Uh, there was that same hesitation of moving to digital. Um, why do you think they're hesitant? Uh, I would think the easy answer is that uh, a lack of knowledge, a lack of hands-on, a lack of results. Uh, but I think that's been changing when they see uh, so many uh, in-focus pictures coming. And uh, many of them might have a mindset that mirrorless is still in its infancy. It's the same camera. It's just uh, recording the image differently, but it's still a digital camera. Uh, it's gotten rid of the mirror, and it's kind of like, uh, you know, like, remember what I said earlier? Like, you, you don't shoot film? <laughs> You're not a real photographer. Only real photographers shoot film. A and some actually advertise that. We use real film. It's like, uh, excuse me, well, I use what? Fake sensors? You know, so um, uh, I remember being questioned on that. Are you going to shoot film uh, at my wedding? No. Oh, well, uh, this photographer said they're going to shoot with uh, real film. So uh, we'll keep that under consideration. And I'm thinking, you know, at the beginning it was like, ah, this, is a, this makes me mad, okay? And then it became a filter. The bride that was asking for something that was none of her business if I was shooting film uh, or if I was shooting digital, and the bride that was asking uh, if I was going to use this lens or that lens, that's not the bride I want to deal with when I go to sit down with her to show her her pictures. The bride that I actually want to sit down with is the one that's actually looking at my samples and saying, I like that kind of picture. I like that kind of picture. Oh, I don't like that type of picture, okay? Uh, because this is where you solve your problems, by opening up your ears and listening. So the actual tool that you use might be important to the photographer, but it should not be important to the end buyer. It's like I don't go to cater or something like a, an anniversary dinner and go, what kind of knives are you using here? What kind of silverware is going to be served? You know, what brand of plates is it? It's like, who the heck cares? Let me taste what your stinking food tastes like, you know, because then I'll know that everybody's going to go, ooh, Peter. This guy is really good at his catering, or like, ugh, this is terrible food. But no one's going to say, this knife is not exactly the knife that I use in my house, you know. So, 
<laughs> that type of thing. So now digital photographers, uh, I mean uh, professional photographers, have that fear factor. So that would be one of the reluctances of going over to digital. They don't know it well enough. There's a learning curve. And you know what? When I started, I was in my teens. Now I'm in my 60s. A lot of these photographers are also not at the age where they want to learn something new. And don't think that is a very small topic because it isn't. Okay, you get settled in. You do the same thing every day. When you get up out of bed, you do the same routine. You go change that routine, you've got an upset day, <laughs> you know. So uh, that's my answer. It's just kind of like not up on uh, in terms of, uh, of the knowledge of what they can do. Well, help me out with this then because I'm a little bit confused. For me, for what I do, it's not a concern, but... I hear people saying that EVFs perform better in low light and OVFs perform better in low light. And where I think this is coming from is people who shoot, uh, to some degree, fast action or sports photography. They, they also say that the EVF is just not fast enough. It can't keep up. Can you shed any light on that? Yes, I think that's a very good point. And uh, not too many camera manufacturers, when they they display, this is the newest thing. They'll tell you, this is what my 4K, I can do 4K 60p, can you? You know, and I can do, you know, 1080 in 60p, 120 and 180p, you know, uh, all that type of stuff. But very few of them actually go and uh, will tell you, this is our EVF refresh rate. So the EVF refresh rate, uh, actually, uh, on the Olympus that I'm using right now, it gives me a choice of the refresh rate. Okay, so this will actually uh, allow, you know, a, a better uh, monitoring of what I'm seeing because obviously an EVF is an electronic viewfinder. So that, that mirror that you see with the optical viewfinder, okay, is gone. So now you've got a little baby television set inside and, you know, all of a sudden, the specifications for that become important because we do that with our computers. I'm looking at a computer screen over here to my right. Okay, so it, it's like, is this a 4K? Is it a 1080? What's the refresh rate and all that kind of, I'll spend all of that time looking at that, but I won't bother to, to find out the EVF. What's the refresh rate, you know, and that type of thing. And the other advantage to the EVF that you had already mentioned, okay, is you can actually focus a little bit better because it'll gain up, meaning the picture is going to get shot at a different exposure than what you're actually seeing in the electronic viewfinder. And your better cameras will have a setting where you tell it to actually show me what the picture is going to look like in my EVF or show me the best uh, exposure. So you'll take a picture and it'll look great in your EVF and you're going like, boy, what a nice camera I've got. And then when you look at your picture, it's like, why so dark? This is too dark. What happened here? Something broke. Something's broken, you know. Uh, and that's because the, the EVF is being exposed properly, but you're not. You didn't set the camera to expose properly in, for some reason, okay. So this ability to up the gain allows you to see things in very dark areas and actually helps the camera focus. Remember I was talking about the focus? Uh, because the camera can gain up and help itself focus. So uh, these are some of the things that are, are going on. All right, now for our next question. I wanna go back to battery, battery life. Um, so Peter, you're a professional, you're going out there to do events and weddings. Um, now, I, I, this is gonna be a long answer because I'm gonna ask several things here. I want you to tell people that, too that the different types of cameras you have, because you're, you're not just a Sony person, you're not a Canon person, you're not an Olympus person. You're the type of person, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong here, you put the right tools in the bag for the job that you're going to do. But I'm really, I, I, I see a lot of like APS-C um, mirrorless cameras, they just don't, they're not able to shoot much more than about 400 shots on a single charge. But as we get up into full frame, I understand that these cameras are capable of a lot more shots per charge. Would you go into battle, into... Uh, event work or wedding work with a mirrorless camera and not have to worry about battery life? Yeah, I, the way I'm going to answer that question is by what you just said, kind of like, would you go into battle 
unprepared is almost kind of like what the question is. So uh, I had the Fuji X-T3 in here and I love the camera. What an amazing camera. As a matter of fact, it makes me uh, very much want to pay attention to what is going to come out with the X-T4, which is supposed to be out in April, but that's up in the air because we have a worldwide event happening. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that terrorized me, and I'm over dramatizing here, was the battery life on the X-T3 is like, I didn't know if I could shoot a complete video without it stopping, okay? And if it did stop, I wasn't smart enough to ask for a second battery. I've had that brought in as a review unit, okay? I didn't own it, okay, just so people know. So they sent me that camera to try it out and review it. Um, and that was one of the things is like, I really had to pay attention to the battery on that. Uh, now the X-T4, they put in a much larger battery. Sony was in the same boat. All the Sonys were coming out with these teeny weeny little batteries, you know. Uh, and, you know, you had this, uh, like, uh, with electric cars, they have, like, uh, uh, a distance anxiety or something uh, that they have a, a term for that. You know, range anxiety is the right term, okay? So you don't want to go out and, and drive a car, then you run out of electric, there's no place to plug it in, okay? At least if you run out of gas, you're going to walk three miles to the gas station and come back with gas. So range anxiety is a very true issue. So now they've got them up the Teslas are over 300 miles on one charge, which is pretty good. So I don't know, can I use the word range anxiety for my, uh, for my camera, like on the X-T3 um, uh, to the X-T4? I think that's true. So if you know you're not going to last very long, you better have some extra batteries in there. Now here's something that I don't even, I don't even see people doing anymore, okay? Many of us did not run the camera on the, on the battery that's in the camera, okay? You actually had a plug in the camera that allowed a, a power source, and you'd have like a turbo battery that you would wear on your belt. That was the name of the battery, the Turbo 3, okay? Then that would go through the entire wedding and it would run your flash. So you could run your battery for your flash and the battery for your camera. And the only danger that uh, actually uh, came into play is you felt invincible. And now you started damaging things by, uh, by rapid firing your flash and burning it out, <laughs> okay? It's like, oh, there is no recycle time. Bam, 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 bam. You know, you're just shooting uh, continuously. And while you're shooting continuously, you're overheating the darn, you know, uh, flash unit. Okay, so I many a times I've seen this white piece right here melted out. These suckers get hot. Okay, so uh, uh, range anxiety on, on a camera is very true. And I think they're addressing that. Like I said, the X-T3, the X-T4 has done a lot of improvements and one of them is a bigger battery. Uh, the Sony A7 uh, III, which is what I'm, I'm shooting here, which is this camera here. This is the A7 Mark III from Sony. They have an FX100, which finally, with the event, which with this camera is what, two years old? They came out with a battery size that Canon has had all along. Okay, Canon has had these nice, big, fat, juicy batteries in them. So um, the, the camera that you and I both like, the, the R5, uh, they're saying that uh, the battery is going to be similar to the 5D Mark IV, which is a hefty battery. So if you already own those batteries because you have a 5D Mark IV or a camera that uses that battery, you've got some in stock, okay? Now, for in here, I'm not using batteries at all. I can't afford to have that nervousness of what's going to stop. <clears throat> so I have a, a battery adapter that goes into the wall for each of my three cameras that I've got in here. So once I start recording, something else would have to, would have to die, <laughs> okay? But usually, unless I actually get a power blink, you know, it's not gonna be the battery. Well, thanks, Peter, but there's one question you didn't answer. Um, you, now, we, we went back and we talked a lot about what cameras you first used um, prior to moving over to digital, but I think a lot of people would be surprised to know how many cameras you currently use today. Can you tell us about the cameras you use today and which lens you, lenses you really like? Sure, that would be a, actually a happy thing. We're now looking at a Sony. 
uh, and it's a full frame A7 Mark III, um, and it's actually, I would call it my lead camera. And then from there, uh, I'm using an Olympus. Well, wait, you did ask me about the lens. Okay, so the lens on that camera is a 50 millimeter a Sony Zeiss lens, a 1.4 lens where I'm actually uh, shooting it at 1.4. And the reason for that is I want my channel or my look to have a signature look, and that is my background is blurred out. It's kind of like a portrait. If I actually shut up for a second and stood still, that could be a portrait, okay? So I try to replicate that. So the other camera that I've got going here is an, an Olympus camera. Now this is strange because uh, this Olympus was, uh, came out in 2016, so you go like, Peter, what are you doing with such an old camera? Well, Olympus came out with a flagship camera, uh, and, and to make a long story short, they put the firmware from that camera, all the good features, or 99.99% .99 of those features, in their older EM-1 Mark II. So this is an Olympus EM-1 Mark II. And that took it like to a brand new 2020 camera. I can actually walk back and forth with this camera and it'll stay in focus uh, almost as well as my Sony. Will it trip up? Yeah, it will trip up here and there, but then the Sony will trip up also. So this older camera that you can buy used from $700 to $900 has become a modern day 2020 camera, but it's a flagship camera, not an entry camera, meaning there's a lot of little goodies in there. So the lens I have on there is a 25 millimeter Olympus brand. It's called the Olympus Pro, which would be the, the upper level lenses, 1.2, and it is set to 1.2. So on a, a micro four thirds sensor, I'm still getting decent background blur. And then the third camera that I've got running here, I call it my hand cam. Okay, I'm giving you a thumbs up. This is where I would actually come in and show you uh, you know, this is what this camera looks like with that lens. Uh, I don't actually use this camera here, but it's a good camera to hold. And this lens is an amazing lens. So that's what I use uh, that uh, uh, camera for. So I'm running a three camera system that allows me to have two different angles. And I also have a fourth tripod set up for a guest camera. And that's a camera that I might have coming in from B&H, which I do have a camera coming in from B&H. Uh, which is the, uh, what is it, the, the Nikon Z6. Uh, I had it here and I didn't like it, but my friend has it, and his name is Peter also, and he says they changed a lot of stuff with the firmware, so I'm going, okay, I just experienced this Olympus having a firmware change, uh, where before I wouldn't even consider this camera, okay, uh, and now I love it. So I'm going to try the, the, uh, the Sony, the Z6, uh, and see if it's true, it's like one of those show me moments. I want to do the walk of focus that I do uh, here uh, to test the focus system out. Okay, so I hope I answered your question on that. Yes, you did. All right, Peter, I'd like to go to some user questions. I've got about four or five of them here. Paris Sermon, um, and I hope I said your name correctly, he's got a question here. What qualitative difference do you find in the final output when shooting with a mirrorless body? And the second part to his question, which features in mirrorless has made your life easy and which features uh, do you think are a gimmick? Well, this is the DSLR versus mirrorless uh, question type of thing again. Uh, the first part is the quality. Uh, the quality has nothing to do with whether it's mirrorless or whether it's uh, a DSLR. It's the quality of the sensor that's in it. So if I took an old, old, old camera, like let's say the 70D maybe, <laughs> and compared it with the um, uh, EOS, uh, what is it, the R5 that's coming out. It's not that one is mirrorless and one is a DSLR. It's that the sensors have marched forward in research and development, and the electronics that runs those sensors have marched forward. So the answer to that question is you're asking the wrong question. So uh, it, it's actually like, would, would DSLR give me a worse picture? than a mirrorless camera? Well, the answer to that is absolutely not. Not in a hundred years. So the 1DX Mark III is not a mirrorless camera. But when you turn live view on, wow, it becomes a mirrorless camera. 
So that camera is a very expensive camera. It's $6,500, okay? And at the same time, uh, it's a full photographic camera you, with no uh, uh, negatives to it. And if you don't like that, switch to live view. And when you switch to live view, you've got everything a mirrorless camera has except the electronic viewfinder. You still have to look at the LCD on the back. Uh, and one day, who knows, maybe Canon will come out with a hybrid where you can flip a something in that, uh, that hump they got up there. So you can either look at an EVF or you can look at, uh, you know, uh, through the mirror. So you would have, uh, you know, I don't know how it would work. Okay, that's just coming off the top of my head. But the sensor quality between a mirrorless and a DSLR, eh, nothing different. It's the age, the technology, and the research and development, and the color codec, the color, uh, whatever they call that uh, technology that they have in the, in the camera. That makes a difference. Thank you, Peter. This one from Cavite Tech. So thank you, Cavite Tech. Event photo videographer here. I use the 700D for all my work. I have all the accessories needed, gimbals, flashes, triggers, mics. Should I go mirrorless with the M50 or should I buy better lenses? I use the kit lens and 50 millimeter for everything. Does a better lens impact my output compared to reliable autofocus on video with the M50? Interesting question there, Peter. That is an interesting question. The interesting part of the, 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 the first two questions is shows how people are not interpreting their list of priorities. So he's got a good question, but it's hidden in there, okay? So what's hidden, uh, the, the part that's in there is should I go from the T7i or the 700D, okay, which is a rebel level camera to basically he picked the M50, okay? So with the T7i or the 700D, you get dual pixel autofocus, okay, full time, full frame. The M50 does not have that. It has it in certain places. So if you choose to run your M50 camera, the new one, uh, as a 1080 camera, then it will compete with your T7i. But should you choose to go over to 4K, uh, the, uh, the Canon company and their in infinite wisdom there has dumbed everything down for you. So even though it says 4K on it, you don't truly have a 4K video format. Now in terms of taking pictures, Okay, because the, the gentleman did mention events, but it sounded to me like he was actually doing um, video. Uh, it, that's what the, the question sounded like. So the T50, I'm sorry, the M50 is actually more handicapped in video uh, because uh, they want to keep the price down. So you don't have a clean HDMI. So should you choose to record on a Ninja or some kind of an external recorder, you can't do that. So why are you buying a new camera? You're, you're not really taking any kind of a big step forward with going from the T7i to an M50. Now, if you go to the M6 Mark II, that's a different story. All of a sudden, Canon has opened up the floodgates and has allowed more stuff to happen in there. Not everything, but it has allowed more stuff to happen. Okay. Now, the most interesting and most important part of the question is if you kept your 700D, which is also known as a T7 or T7i, okay, the lenses make all the difference in the world. You, I would rather have an old shabby camera with an up-to-date, really, really great lens than a brand new R5 that we're all waiting for with a lens that I would call like the bottom of a Coca-Cola bottle, okay? It's thick and blurry, okay? So the, it's the, the camera will come to life. Like you got a brand spanking new camera if you go buy yourself an L lens and put it on your T7i, okay? Uh, especially if you get a prime. If you get a 50 millimeter 1.8, which is not expensive. Those are like, what, uh, $200? Uh, in the $200 box, it might be up to 300. It might be down to 100. That will make your T7i come to life. Where buying a, a new camera like the M50 and still using their same lenses, you're gonna get the same results. What's the definition of, of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. So every camera, not just Canon, every camera, the better the glass that you feed it, 
to give it a kind of like a, a cool saying, the better results it'll give you, okay? So the lens makes a huge difference. You're much better off buying a newer, better quality lens than you are buying a new camera, unless you need a new feature, okay? The lens is not gonna add a new feature, okay? So that is separate from, we're just talking quality here, all right? So that, that's my answer to that, Simon. No, I agree wholeheartedly, Peter. A lot of the lenses I bought for my 70D are what I consider the L series or professional series. And I'm glad I did because now that I'm looking to go to the, the EOS RF platform, I can take those lens, port them over, and I can still produce the same quality results. So when I get my new lenses, I don't have to go, oh, I got to get my general purpose lens again. I got to get a 51.2 again. Nope. I can go to something more interesting like a 15 to 35. Although I'll probably get the 24 to 105 because it's a full frame and what I've got for my 70D won't work. Question from Ronnie, and he's got two. So the first question is, what kind of uh, photography do you shoot? And I think you've already answered that. It's mostly product or event wedding work. And what features, or let me ask you, uh, let me re-ask this question. What made you finally switch to mirrorless? What was it that you thought made mirrorless ready? The very first thing that I saw about mirrorless that attracted me uh, is something that uh, I guess for me, it plagued me through all my years. And that is the, the ratio of how many pictures uh, I come home with on a professional level that are in focus. Uh, and then when I tried, um, I, I tried a camera, I think it was an early Olympus. I think it was called an E10 or something like that. And it was like, whoa, how come everything's so sharp here? It must be, it must be, the lens, <laughs> okay? Or it must be because it's uh, Olympus or something or who knows what. Uh, and then when I did a little bit of research, all it did, all it took was like five minutes, you know, to figure out, well, mirrorless, it's got a completely different focus system. All the focusing is done on the sensor and I started paying attention. So uh, I started to look and see uh, that these guys are getting a lot sharper pictures. So I flipped my own camera to live view and I had a thousand percent increase in quality. So I'm a professional photographer and I'm shooting, and I'm shooting like an amateur, like holding my camera out and shooting. But you wanna know something? Just by going to the live view mode on my Canon, uh, even on my Nikon, okay, changed dramatically uh, the, the focus ratio, which is important because this is your inventory. You're coming home with X number of shots. So if you have to shoot 4,000, 5,000 shots to come up with two, 300 good ones versus you can shoot only 1,500 or 2,000 to come up with the same 200 uh, good pictures, they, that became like, all right, let's take a look into this mirrorless stuff. So that's what attracted me was the, 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 the focus. All the other stuff I considered baby talk, okay? And I'm sorry to say it like that. But this business that, oh, it's got to be smaller. It's so cute. You know, that's how girls buy cars. They want a small, cute car. Where guys buy cars, I want a big engine in there. I want to go fast, okay? So a big, heavy camera like the 1DX, 1DX Mark III today, is an advantage. It's got a built-in gimbal, you know? The weight itself doesn't allow as much movement. So it wasn't the size that attracted me, which is what most people go to mirrorless and they go like, oh, it's a nice smaller camera. It's so much lighter. Well, I don't want that. I want a bigger, heavier camera, please. Bigger. No, no, heavier than that. Okay. And the reason is it's got stabilization built into the camera just by its own weight. So it isn't I, the I, size that matters. Okay. I know you know size matters, but it doesn't. Well, well, it does, but I'll say it this way, Peter. Size matters an awful lot, but it matters on getting the right size. So. For example, if I'm young and I love traveling and I want to capture photos and videos, I might want a really small camera that I can just put in my shirt or in my pocket. And, you know, something like a Fuji X100V might be perfect for me. But if I'm doing a lot of video and I do a lot of run and gun work, then yeah, something like a 1DX Mark III where it's got that weight and it's got that balance, where it's got its built-in, as you say, gyroscope, its built-in gimbal, I can produce much more smoother video. So I, I, I'd say that, Weight matters, but it's in terms of what outputs you're getting, what type of capabilities you're getting. I think that's what matters. 
You're not putting a 1DX Mark III in your pocket? You're buying the wrong pants, dude. No, but if I was traveling with my family to Europe, I'm not gonna take a 1DX Mark III, and that's where I'm making sacrifices. So if I end up going with the R5 or the R6, this is small enough, I can put it around my neck, I can get on the plane, the, the stewardess isn't gonna get upset with me. Uh, I can usually just put it under my chair. I, I don't have any problems wherever I go. I, I like that size, it's not too big, it's not too small, battery life is pretty good. It just, it's balance. It's, if you, if you get everything perfect in one way, you're trading off on something else, I think. Well, I agree. There's a episode of the I Love Lucy show, which is uh, widespread enough where you probably uh, know who, what uh, television show I'm talking about, where Luthi, Lucy and Ethel are going on a, uh, a, a vacation to the Alps or something, and Lorenzo Lamas is, uh, is the guest star on that uh, 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 show and it was their basic format, okay. But Ethel was shooting this, the 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 snapshots of a tourist with a twin lens reflex camera, the Roloflex, strapped around her neck as if it was just a casual camera to go with. So that joke about you haven't put a 1DX Mark III in your pocket, you're buying the wrong pants, you know. Uh, but I I remember that episode because of the camera, okay. It's like who hangs a twin lens reflex around their neck? you know, to, to go up to the, the Alps where you're skiing and stuff. You know what those look like, right? They're pretty big cameras. Yeah, but it goes back to that similar state. Um, we've all heard this a million times. What's the best camera? And I'm gonna tell you what the perfect camera is. I'm gonna blow the lid off. I, I know Casey's, he's probably gonna get upset here because I've identified the perfect camera. Do you know what the perfect camera is, Peter? The perfect uh, camera actually, Simon, is the one in your hand. That's right. And you know what? No matter how good of a camera you have when you're out and about, sometimes you're, you're with your kid in the park, your phone's always with you. And you know what? I wish I had had my 70D with me, but I've got my phone. It saves the day. So that's the biggest trade-off. But that portability, I think, is huge. So when I said the X100V, I wasn't kidding. In some situations, the X100V is a better camera. Sometimes the Nikon D850, it really depends on your use case scenarios and the capabilities you want. But let me get to a few more questions because we're running out of time here. Um, Ashton asked, are there any unbearable situations in which the EVS throws off your shooting? And also, have you seen any improvements in your focusing using a mirrorless or DSLR? And you already answered that last part, I believe. All right, my answer is gonna sound a little bit weird, okay? Uh, but it's actually a very true answer, and this is by a number of different people that have actually asked me this question directly. It seems that if you're an eyeglass wearer, like I am, that the EVF sometimes causes it to be harder for you to actually focus. In other words, that little range that they have uh, to focus is not strong enough, or the glare, because it's producing a light, um, the only negative thing that I have seen people run into, which for me, just switch over to the LCD, okay, uh, is the fact that an eyeglass wearer seems to have more of a fight with the camera than they would have if it was an optical uh, camera. Maybe not be what you want, want to hear, but that's, the, that's what I've actually come across, not only myself, but with people too. Well, that's all the questions I have, uh, Peter. Do you have any um, questions or comments for me? Hmm, what would I ask Simon? Well, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about what is actually interesting about you, okay, in terms of what everybody would be interested in. And that would be, you are a, uh, a starter, meaning just a few months ago, I don't want to name the months because I actually don't remember, but let's say five months, six months, you were at 10 to 12 subscribers and that's it. That was the whole shebang. Now, you, you're, you're, you, you've crossed 3,000, if I'm correct, and you're heading uh, and closing in on 4,000. Um, does that surprise you? How does it feel to have that kind of a growth? Uh, and it's also a testament to your, the quality of the videos that you're, you're doing. Your content is, is right on. Uh, you don't present it with a lot of fluff, like I do, unfortunately. And uh, the fruits, of your work are, are actually showing. So how does it feel to be heading towards 4,000 and after that to 5,000, Simon? Well, Peter, I think part of me is very much an overachiever. So I'm never completely happy with 
my results. But I, I, I do step back and I do realize in under six months, well, first of all, in under three months, I got monetized. So I had 4,000 hours of watch time. I had 1,000 subscribers. And what's good is I'm reaching my goals. I set my goals. I, I was hoping to make about one to $200 a month to help fuel my camera hobby. And I've reached that. I'm getting, I think only one month I didn't hit 200. So for me, that's, that's kind of a major milestone, but this is a hobby for me. I really enjoy it. I've learned a lot more about lighting. I've learned a lot more about videography and photography. And of course, being able to communicate with people to be able to present. Uh, in my day job, I'm an enterprise architect and we do a lot of workshops. We do a lot of speaking, we do presentations. And this is helping me fine tune that in a much more difficult medium. Looking directly at this lens here, it's not smiling at me. In fact, it's very intimidating, but I, I think what's really important here and what's important for everybody who's watching to really understand, I didn't get to 4,000 or just shy of 4,000 subscribers um, because I'm really good at what I do or because of my experience. I got here because I realized I wasn't good at this. I initially watched uh, a Think Media production and a Peter McKinnon production. I was watching a lot of people at the time and they said, just get out there, start filming, use your smartphone. Don't just sit down, just try it. You're gonna produce really terrible stuff at first, but you're gonna go get better. Don't believe me? Look at my earlier videos. Look at how bad they were, they said. So I started and very quickly, um, I don't know what it was, what started it, but I was watching one of your videos and right at the end, or somewhere you said, and by the way, if, if you have any questions, give me a call. Uh, in the description down below, I have a little service where you give me a call, it's $30, and I'll help you with what you need help with. So I thought $30 after the $700 I've already spent, but I thought, you know, I think that's a good investment here. It's not about tech that I need, I need advice. Your channel was very polished, and I thought, I do need some mentoring here. I was smart enough to realize I couldn't answer all these questions myself. I couldn't just watch videos and learn. I want to learn by standing on the shoulders of people that came before me. And as you know, um, I had two consultations in those early days. One, I think it was early November, and then one, I think much later in about January. And I'm still applying some of those techniques. And then recently, about five weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago, the time is, a, right now, the whole time, what day a week it is, it's a little bit confusing to me, but anyhow, it was about four or five weeks ago, um, you said, your lighting's off a little bit. And we got into a discussion, you said, hey, let, let's remote in, I'll, I'll show you, and you, you, you took a look at my, uh, my final cut setup, and you said, oh, well, here, look, we can make some changes here to your color wheels. So we made changes to the color wheels, and actually in a video later than that, I tweaked that because it was blowing out some of the colors of my desk and of my shirt. So I created a shape mask and I applied your color settings to that shape mask and it added one step further. But then you said, okay, there's something wrong with your lighting, you're getting too much of a glare. And all the videos I watched, all the videos said, you wanna have one or two lights in front of you diagonally shining directly on you. And that was giving me a major glare. And what you did is something that nobody else I have seen on YouTube suggested. So I took my two lights, and guys, I've got the Godox uh, LED lights, and I had, he basically said, turn them and face them directly to each other. I'm thinking, okay, I'll try this. And then he said, just turn them ever so slightly, like a two and a half, five degree turn. And that's it. So the lighting that's coming off me is coming off these two lights that are more or less pointing directly at each other but it's giving me enough ambient light that my face isn't really just blown out completely. I have another light here that's shining on my desk and I have two lights shining behind me so that the green screen that I'm using doesn't make my shoulders green or anything. And then one shining on the, the light. So I, I, I'd say yes, I, to answer your question, uh, see, I can ramble on too, Peter. Um, it, it's, I think the biggest part to doing this is not to be afraid to ask for help. Uh, it's to listen. Uh, Think Media was very good and I agreed with them. It, it, it's, it's very strategic what you're doing. You need to have a vision. Where do you want your channel to be? Because that's gonna give you focus. Uh, and you need goals and objectives because they take things down a little bit more where the rubber hits the road. So what are you trying to do? What do you wanna do? And it's, 
it's not necessary to make the money. It's about what do you want to do with your channel? Is this a hobby for you? Is this going to be a business? Then start setting milestones, key performance indicators of what you want to achieve. I've reached most of mine. I'm hoping that within the next month and a half, I'll hit 5,000 subscribers. But the fact that I'm almost at 4,000 means a lot to me. Um, a lot of my subscribers, a lot of you guys watching, I appreciate this. It's I've created a community where we can share ideas, where we can ask questions about products, about filming techniques, about content creation, and I really enjoy that. And look at these relationships that I've created. I've got a relationship with Peter. Peter's a great guy. I really enjoy working with Peter. Uh, another gentleman out of the UK I'm going to be talking to after this video, and we're looking at doing an interview too, and he's into astrophotography and video and travel video. And that's what I like about this is it's it's like you're entering a whole new world, but it's not virtual. It's real people. So that's my answer, Peter. Long, long winded. And, and people say I'm long winded. Golly gee whiz, Batman. <laughs> uh, I do want to follow up with another question, though. I'm almost sure. afraid to ask it. Wouldn't you say I'm putting words in? I'm answering it for you that it actually becomes more serious when you actually see a financial reward that comes along with it. It's no longer a game. It's not something you just pop on and pop off or try something new every other time. Like you, you aren't out surfing now this week and then next week you're camping and hiking, you know, uh, but because they actually sent you money, you, you started to say, wait a minute, if there's money involved here, this could actually become a serious thing. I still want to do my, what, what did you, what is it you taught me? My vision. Okay. Yeah. But it takes on a discipline of being a real honest to goodness business, which a real honest to good, goodness business must have a certain level of discipline to it. Timing, uh, you know, uh, equipment and so on and so forth. So when you first started getting your first check, did it make it seem more real that this could actually become a real live business instead of going and working for Burger King and flipping burgers when I get older, you know? Well, it, it did, uh, but because I was already more mature and I was focused on architecture and delivering results, it was more of an affirmation that what I was doing was right, that the, the, the approach I had taken was right. And when you get that first check, at least for me, and you actually don't get a check, they put it right in your account, which is awesome. And if you're not from the United States, the good news is, you get those US dollars sent to you and they go in a US dollar account in your bank. So you don't have to worry about any of that currency stuff. But what's really nice is that money you've spent on lights, that you spent on stands, that you maybe spent on a teleprompter, an iPad or other technology, you can now see that that is paying off. You now have a return on your investment. You have a way of budgeting. And I don't mind sharing with you guys. I'm honest with you guys. There's certain information I can't share, like I think it's CPC, according to uh, YouTube's terms. But I've made a, I've probably spent close to about $1,400 on channel-related stuff. And just a few weeks ago, I had broken even. So the money that I'm bringing in now is going to be going towards that R5 or R6 when it comes out. And I'm reinvesting back into the channel. And I think that's a really good part of that affirmation is you realize this is serious and I'm almost 50. I see this as something that I can do when I retire. Without retiring, I can do something that I enjoy that really is a lot of fun, Peter. Well, that's excellent. Thank you so much, Simon, for having me on your channel, Ordinary Filmmaker. And uh, thank you for e even considering me as somebody to interview. Uh, I, uh, I pray, you know, the best for, and the safety for everybody. And Peter, thank you so much once again for participating with me. Um, yes, we are friends, but you know we didn't start that way. And I appreciate all the mentoring you've provided with me, all you've provided for me, and the continued advice that you give me. It's very much appreciated. So thank you very much for joining me here today, uh, today, Peter. And thank you for tuning in to watch my channel. It's very much appreciated. Stay tuned. I'll see you again soon. Thank you for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. All equipment used and notes are placed in the description box, show more box, or down arrow thingy next to the title on the mobile app.